What does she see in him? Abrestophiles and spree killers. Stick around. Welcome back to another episode of Just a Tip with Dr. Vic slash Sex Nerd Podcast. My name is Dr. Victoria Hartman. And as you may have gathered from my intro, we're going to have a really interesting discussion, exploration of a phenomenon that I've only recently become aware of, and that is what's called hybristophilia. Now, I had originally inquired with some of my colleagues about a different behavior that I thought perhaps could have a paraphilic definition as I study paraphilias. However, uh, there was very little literature out there on that particular phenomenon. However, one of them did send me this um, study on hybristophilia. And I'm going to jump into what exactly hybristophilia is. One of the reasons why I'm so fascinated by this in particular is because of a, my book that I'm currently, um, I'm not writing it at the moment. It's still in its conceptual phases, but it is talking, it's starting to take shape and it's starting to show divisions within it. And so, and I'm starting to navigate Many of you know that I've studied paraphilias in the non-criminological and more paraphilic realms of sexuality, but I'm, I've am i been slowly moving into the criminological, which they've always kind of crossed over, but now I'm diving into the criminological. And um, as this book is taking shape, I'm reading more and more papers on very interesting aspects of the criminological side of what I've been studying all these years. So let's dive in. So very simply, a hybristophile is most often a woman who fetishizes killers. This particular paper focuses specifically on two cases of spree killers, and I will tell you which two cases those are. And the what appears to be at least two different types of hybristophiles with regard to the different kinds of spree killing. This particular study, and I will put a link to it in the description, largely used Tumblr fan site content, which included text and pictures. Now the authors argue that they are looking at this phenomenon through an evolutionary lens. And the way in which they describe looking at it in that manner is largely Darwinian uh, for whatever natural phenomena there is, there is a mirror or a response to it, okay? It's evolutionary and there's a response to each evolutionary behavior. This paper centers largely around heterosexual women. However, they did find some gay hybristophiles. However, there wasn't enough of that particular subset of this group for them to do, to even address it in this paper. But they did acknowledge that they did find a few, there just wasn't enough material to actually do any kind of a, a scientifically rigorous examination. In 2019, King and Butler, benefiting from insights bequeathed by Darwin, documented a bimodal pattern of male spree killers. This division contained a group of younger ones who exhibited signs of pathological attempts to obtain a certain form of status. This set of particular patterns that killers exhibited implied a co-evolved audience, but in this case, one of heterosexual women, females, receptive to those, sig to those signals. And this paper documents, this journal paper documents some features of that audience. Hybristophilia specifically is a paraphilia of the marauding predatory type in which sexual erotic arousal and attainment of orgasm are responsive to and contingent upon being with a partner known to have committed outra an outrage or crime, 
such as rape, murder, and armed robbery. The term hebristophilia has been applied to women who are attracted to violent criminals. That was a study by Sharma in 2003, as well as Gurian in 2013. Now this is, this goes beyond the, she's into bad boys, just to clarify. Now they're, they add an argument that this could be a manifestation of celebrity culture and how we as a society increasingly elevate narcissistic individuals with self-interest on a grand scale and identify with those individuals, especially in younger people, that they elevate these individuals, these narcissistic individuals. And it also contributes to their identity formation as they are growing into adulthood, which in and of itself presents quite a few problems. Bristophilia comes in a level of degrees and it's far more prevalent in women. Bristophiles may be the victims of physical or sexual abuse, resulting in low self-esteem and feelings of insecurity, predisposing the individual to deviant sexual preferences and criminality. I'm still challenged by the word deviant, but for the purposes of this paper, I will read it as is. However, Support for such a hypothesis is far from compelling. Eisenberg in 1991 suggested that women who engage in relationships with criminals evaluate their relationship as a companionship rather than a sexual or romantic coupling. Bristophiles may also wish to collaborate with a violent offender to express their own violent tendencies or because at a conscious level, they want to rehabilitate the criminal. So this mixed picture of attraction has led to a twofold typology of hybristophile. One is considered a passive hybristophile with little interest in committing criminal behavior, but do derive sexual pleasure from seeking relationships with specific individuals who have committed criminal acts. Aggressive hybristophiles derive sexual pleasure from the criminal act itself and sometimes may coax a partner into committing a crime with them. It should be noted that there is limited consensus about the diagnosis and symptomology of hybristophilia. It could be that it forms the extreme end of a continuum of sexual desire rather than being viewed as a disorder. And many authorities have regarded hybristophiles as similar to fans of celebrities. Now, what these researchers did is they took two particular incidents of spree killing, one being the Columbine massacre in 1999, and the other being the Century movie theater spree killing in Aurora, Colorado in 2012 by James Holmes. Now, in order to have reasonable controls, especially considering the age groups, one being ages 15 to 20, the other being ages 20 to 25, and it seemed as though the group uh, centered around James Holmes was the aged 15 to 20, 15 to 20, and the Columbine massacre aged 20 to 30, I'm sorry, in this group. They compared it to the fan groups on Tumblr to One Direction, which were 15 to 20 year olds, and Ryan Gosling, which were at the time of the study, 20 to 25 year olds. Now they did have some variables here in order to identify the types of aristophiles, which included sexual content, violent content, tool of notoriety, subject of image, and realism. They also looked at this phenomenon through psychological constructs from multiple perspectives to add to the validity of those constructs. And the clinical literature they found described a phenomenon, a typology of hypostophiles divided into those who eroticize the perpetrators and those who wish to emulate them. Now they found also that in this uh, exploratory typology investigation that the fans from Columbine differed, the of the Columbine massacre differed significantly from the fans of the James Holmes crime, had certain similarities with One Direction and Ryan Gosling fans. Surprisingly, they said, the fans of James Holmes exhibited similar patterns of visual representation and eroticism centered on the perpetrator 
to the fans of One Direction and Ryan Garslin. Now, the fans of the Columbine Massacre seemed to represent the more aggressive publicistophile type. And the evidence for this comes from both the image, textual, and textual analyses. These findings support the theory advanced by Vitello in 2006 that individuals' violent tendencies as portrayed through images and text underlie and contribute to the development of hybristophilia. The images from this group tended to be high in violent realism, but with relatively low sexual content. The hybristophilia here does center more on the crime than the perpetrator who appears more as a mediating object of the fetish rather than the focus itself. For example, there's no talk with this group of changing the perpetrator and often open acknowledgement that they would not desire them but for the crimes they committed. Interestingly, however, the Columbine fans tended to describe their emotions of their attraction as long-lasting, innate, and expressing admiration for the subject of their attraction. This suggests that the Rampage Shooter fans, the aggressive hybristophiles, do possess a potent romantic attraction for their subjects that is not ordinarily associated with celebrity worship. And in the case of the Columbine fans, that this attraction is long-lasting and innate. The writers of the passages of the Columbine Cluster were observed to express a negative self-concept more often than the writers of passages in the Holmes Cluster or in the Comparative Celebrity Cluster. And finally, the Columbine fans displayed significantly more knowledge of and identification with the shooter's ideology, demonstrating the Columbine fans' interest in the true nature of the criminal acts and which suggests that these individuals may represent an audience responding to the Columbine shooter's communicative strategy. Increasingly, some shooters are leaving behind manifestos of their beliefs, attitudes, and rationalizations, and it is likely that this particular type of a bristophile will be particularly engaged with this kind of material. Comparatively, the visual representations utilized by the James Holmes fans were similar to the visual representations utilized by the celebrity fans, with low levels of violence and high levels of sexualized depictions. However, this was not the whole story. The textual analyses revealed that the passages written by the fans of James Holmes differed significantly from the passages written by the celebrity fans. The James Holmes fans would appear to fit the pattern of the passive hybristophile. The textual passages from the Holmes and celebrity clusters tended to have themes of redemption and change with the fanaticist in the role of the redeemer. This pattern did not emerge in the Columbine hybristophiles and these would fit with Vitello's description of hybristophiles who believe that they can rehabilitate the perpetrator. The more aggressive hybristophiles harbored no such fantasies. The more passive hybristophiles had more in common with the celebrity worshipers in this respect with heightened interests in images implying sexual arousal. Now the concern here is, especially in the adolescent group, that if adolescents use their parasocial relationship with a rampage shooter to form blueprints for their future relationships, or if adults use the behavior of a rampage shooter as inspiration for their own behavior, this is worthy of concern albeit different types. They close the paper with the following. Recently, some spree killers have begun to issue manifestos about their self-described motives. It is highly likely that these will have measurable effects on their fan base and should probably be a source of concern for law enforcement and clinical intervention, as well as risk assessment. Now, they do know that there were several limitations to this study, in particular, that even though it was an explorative investigation, it was only amongst one site. It only compared two types of spree killings um, in comparison to celebrity fan basing like Ryan Gosling. And that this is not just celebrity worship. The variability among these individuals has been observed, suggesting that there are two broad types of rampage shooter fans, potentially representing either passive or aggressive hybristophilia. The aggressive ones may well represent a risk on their own as their obsession with the acts 
rather than redeeming and reforming the perpetrators could be of concern to law enforcement and mental health professionals. A convergence of theoretical, i.e. evolutionary and clinical, and practical forensic and law enforcement, models of spree killing seems attainable and desirable. Now, a particular interest to me um, is the textual and visual representations of these particular of this particular paraphilia and how it divides itself into two typologies in particular because of the work that I'm doing on this next book which largely utilizes that form of media is to identify and examine various forms of visual depictions comparatively between non-offending and offending um necrophiles. So gleaning some perspective into those individuals' fan bases, especially from an evolutionary perspective, is of particular interest because it, it creates a more diverse perspective on, well, visual depictions of sexuality and the various forms that it takes and how do we do comparatives between non-offending and offending how do we do comparatives between uh say celebrity fans and spree killer fans and so forth so these intricacies are a particular interest for me right now plus i'm reading like three books that are each that big and also a number of journal papers centered around these things so this was a particular interest for me because of that exploration for my book, but also because it's just an interesting topic, fibristophilia, and its sources. The interest, the thing about paraphilias is we don't really know where they come from. They don't really know. We don't really know how they're formed. There are some arguments that paraphilias are the result of exposure. Others argue that paraphilias are already there, they're innate, and it simply takes a trigger for them to come to the surface. They're already there. And there's disagreement among sexologists as to what, you know, it's a chicken and egg argument. Or is it a combination of the two? Do we know its origins? And that's ultimately what it comes back to is how do we identify its origins and that is an ongoing question that no one has an answer to especially where paraphilia is concerned and i even did just a a, a show on my channel recently about whether or not the, the idea of a paraphilia is a scientifically supported valid construct so there's even conversation in the sexological community amongst scholars as to whether or not paraphilia is even a thing or it should be called that thing or it should be something else so however for the purposes of this paper we were looking at fibristophilia i will put a link to the paper it is in the journal of police and criminal psychology and this was published oh this was a manuscript draft which is from 2017 if I can find the, the link to this, I will make sure to, to put it on my YouTube channel. I'm currently doing a number of really interesting projects, my book being one of them. Um, I'm also doing some film work that I will hopefully be sharing soon. And uh, it'll be sort of a, a little bit of a, I'll be going off the beaten path with the film work stuff, um, simply because I have a background in film and I've been sort of exploring it lately from a different angle. Uh, if you have any suggestions about what you would like me to investigate on some of my shows coming up, please do let me know in the comments below. And in the meantime, I think that's about it. This was kind of a brain teaser episode and I really appreciate you watching. Well, with that, I'm gonna wrap up and I will see you next time right back here on Sex Nerd Podcast, Just a Tip with Dr. Vic. Bye.